at 7.30 in the Minor Hall. There will be a session meeting on Wednesday afternoon at 2 and then the committee meeting on Wednesday evening at 8 and the, the girls' brigade on Thursday evening at the usual times. Then next Lord's Day morning and evening worship uh, as usual. Uh, so do remember these meetings as we come together. We come together this evening to worship God and here's a, a word from the psalmist that will be uh, uh, impinging upon our uh, thoughts tonight. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. We turn this evening to Psalm 148. We sing praise to God from the Psalm stand, the A version. We're singing stanza one and then four to eight. Uh, Psalm 148, A one and then four to eight, and the tune is Ulster number 260. What a, a joy the psalmist has. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord now. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise him in the highest places. All his angels praise, proclaim. And all of us ought to be giving praise to God. In fact, the whole earth, and that's what he says in stanza four, uh, from the earth, O oh, praise the Lord. Uh, all the deeps, fire, hail, snow, clouds, to everything should be giving its praise to God, for he is Lord and creator. He goes on to speak about the earth, the fruit, the trees, the, the creeping things, the birds, kings, all should be praising God, for he is our great God, the creator of all, and he is worthy and deserving of our worship. Psalm 148a, 1 and 4 to 8, the tune is 260. Let us praise God together. <clears throat> Let us pray. 
Gracious God, we praise your name. Enable us to do so faithfully, acknowledging all the great blessings and benefits you have bestowed upon us as yours, created of you, and then called of you out of the darkness of sin into the marvelous light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we should exalt your name and praise you and give ourselves to your worship. And so, Lord, we pray as we enter into this evening hour, you will meet with us again and speak to us through your word. Do us good and bless us as we gather here in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to turn to Psalm 118, and we're going to read from this psalm, Psalm 118, and we read the whole of the psalm. Psalm 118, and beginning to read at verse 1, let us hear God's word. Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. We pray that God will bless to us his own word. <clears throat> this evening, as we come to pray, I want to just focus for a moment on this country of Belgium, 
We've been thinking about these countries now of Europe. We've looked at the Netherlands. We looked at Germany, but Belgium. And this is a deeply divided nation. And we just look at some of the statistics. The population of 11.5 million people are slightly over. And while, again, Christi the Christianity is the, the largest religion at 62%, yet it is a land of huge spiritual need, as you note, evangelicals 1.2%. A divided nation for 2,000 years, its land has stretched across the cultural divide between the Latin Roman world and the Germanic world. Uh, there are different uh, cultures even within Belgium, Flemish to the south, Wallon to the uh, sorry, to Wallon to the south, and the Flemish to the north. Different languages being spoken, and these things all affect the economy, and pol politics, and religious life of the land. Catholicism had been in r rapid decline. Atheists and non-religious are now number thirty-one. Only 48% saw themselves as Catholic in 2010. And of course, uh, that's Roman Catholicism rather than Christianity in its true sense. Protestantism has had mixed fortunes. Over the last 40 years, ev evangelicalism grew, while mainline Protestantism declined to some degree. Pentecostal groups and others uh, have uh, had some stability. The Bible has been reintroduced to Belgium society after many centuries of being discouraged, even banned, by the Catholic Church. And so the United Bible Societies uh, have brought a new translation in 2004 and leading a year of promoting the Scriptures in 2006. So pray for the Bible to be made known in the land of Belgium. Both the Flemish and French Bible societies are involved in making this word known. Belgium is one of the most needy countries of Europe spiritually, great spiritual apathy, and the faith largely banished from the public square. So there are many, many needs, and there are many other things here quoted they uh, coming into the, the land of Muslim peoples from North Africa, Turkish, Kurdistan, and others. The growth in Islam, thus uh, the mosques growing. All of these things have affected this country. There are Chinese churches in Belgium uh, and others as well. And it's maybe among those that sometimes the Church of Christ is actually growing. So Belgium, a country of huge and great need. Let us pray too and remember Ukraine today, uh, as you will hear in the news, further uh, great uh, difficulties for the people there as the Russian forces continue to bombard. Uh, we cannot begin to imagine the plight of the people, not only those who have left home, but those who are still trying to, to live within the borders of Ukraine. We need to pray for our politicians even in dealing with that matter, as well as all the home issues. And we need to pray for our churches facing up to their own challenges uh, in our own society. So with these matters, let us come to God. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, the world is yours and everything in it, and it would be our longing and concern that the peoples of every nation would come to praise you. And as we take a very brief overview of the spiritual life of Belgium, this country that has had over its history influences from all sides, Lord, it grieves us to see that there are so few who truly are interested in the things of Almighty God. But Lord, we do thank you for the, the relatively recent reintroduction of the Scriptures, for the new translation uh, to the Belgian people. And we pray, Lord, that your word will be sent forth, that all who seek to propagate truth will find ready access for that word, and that you will cause it 
to bear fruit in the lives of many people, that we might even in a few years look back and say we have seen the Lord do wondrous things in Belgium through faithful Christian people and through the word of the living God. We thank you, O God, that in the face of the uh, of the apathy towards spiritual things. You're the God who breaks down the apathetic heart and brings renewal. And so we pray your will be done. We think of the challenge of the, largely, of the Muslim communities coming into such a land. And again, O oh God, you are able to open their hearts to the living word and to bring them to Christ, their great need. So, Father, we commit this land to you with all its concerns. But, Father, we are also deeply concerned again this evening for the land of Ukraine. And, Lord, as we think of the, the war in this country, we, all we can do, it seems, is cry out, Lord, God, have mercy. And may you stop this violence towards people. Bring help to Ukrainian people those who have fled the country, wherever they may be, and those who are still trying to live in that land. Our special prayer is for those who are witnessing for Jesus Christ, bringing Bibles and blankets and aid to suffering peoples. May they find spiritual lives ready to receive the word of God, and that as the Bibles are given out, there will be those who will be ready to find hope in Jesus, the only Savior, and the peace of God that passeth understanding in the midst of uh, a war in this physical realm. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, too, for our own politicians reacting to this, these things, and help them, O God, in all the varied and difficult decisions that need to be made. We would cry out, O God, that you will guide them, that you might have mercy upon them, and that they would seek to do good, setting aside their own selfish ambitions to seek to be those who would be statesmen and women leading and ruling for the true good of the nation and of the people. Father, we cry out to you, for we know the greatest need of the souls of men and women around us is to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, our prayer would be that you will come in your power, that you will speak. Use us to speak, O God. May we be bold in being prepared to own Jesus and uphold the right of Christ to challenge the waywardness of others. And Lord, may we be willing to think of him in all our ways. O Lord God, we pray thus that you will build your church. Build us, O God, even up in our own faith and in our congregation and in our denomination, that we might continue to be enabled by your great mercy to go forward in your name and to magnify you. Gracious, loving Father in heaven, Hear our prayer and help us. Even this evening, Lord, encourage us as we turn to the scripture to be led of it. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let us turn again in the word of God. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 21 and we're beginning to read at verse 33. Turning to Matthew chapter 21. We begin to read <coughs> at verse 33. Matthew 21 at verse 33, and we're going to read through to the end of the chapter. Let us hear God's word. Matthew 21, 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect 
his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. Last of all, he sent a son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables. They knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Amen. We pray that God will indeed bless his word. We're going to turn now to Psalm uh, 32, and we're singing stanzas 9 uh, to to, uh, 12, and the tune is Salzburg, number 156. Psalm 32, we sing from stanza 9. To hear the word of the psalmist, I will instruct you and you teach the way that you should go. Maybe in a way it's God speaking to us. He will instruct us. He is the one who guides us. And what a blessing that is to know the guidance and instruction of God. The wicked many sorrows have, but steadfast covenant love encircles every man whose trust is in the Lord above. Many in their wickedness will come to trouble, but the man in the midst of trouble who trusts in the Lord will find blessing. Psalm 32, stanzas 9 to 12, the tune 156, let us praise God together.
We are living in days when there is a great deal of talk about the cost of living crisis. And we know there are people who are struggling. But we also see many people who have been granted a great deal of the blessings of this life. And yet they are still complaining, discontent, and show no appreciation when they have been granted uh, something to try and aid them, uh, and they almost feel as though it, they, they talk about it not being enough, rather than being thankful they've received anything at all, uh, which they had no right to think of that they should receive or even deserve. There are many people who have many good benefits and blessings, not just financially or temporally, but in many ways, health and other things, and yet, they are discontent. They are uh, complaining and show no appreciation, give no thought or reward or even thanks to those who have benefited them in some way. And in this parable that we're going to look at this evening in Matthew chapter 21, we're turning our attention to a parable about people like that. Because as we read this parable, the story of these ungrateful tenants here in Matthew 21, we're reading about a people who have had much blessing bestowed upon them, but they treat despicably the master, the one whom they had a right and should have given thanks to, rewarded with some of the fruit of the vineyard. Now, we've read the parable, and we know that uh, the story, the vineyard owner plants the vineyard and makes every preparation for it. It's ready, sitting, waiting for the tenants. All they have to do is come, tend the vines, uh, reap the rewards, press the grapes to get the juice, and everything is there for their help. And it is fitting, according to the agreement, that the master, the owner, should send at due time someone to say, well, now it's time for you to give the master the fruit. His portion, it can be, there can be no doubt that there was some agreement between the tenant and the master. You will give me a certain amount of your fruit, 5%, 10%, whatever it was, in reward for my allowing you to work this vineyard with everything so prepared. But these wicked tenants, these wicked men, have no thought about giving anything back to the owner. And as this parable unfolds, we see the incredible way in which this landowner treats these tenants, unworthy though they are. And of course, the parable does speak to us of God, because that's what parables do. And the landowner is clearly the Lord God of heaven, who has prepared a vineyard, Israel, for his people, who sent the prophets in due time that he might prompt them to bring to God that sacrifice and worship and honor which was his due. In fact, to remind them or call them back to their responsibility to God. And how did they treat the prophets? Despicably. And God, in his great love, sent finally his Son, the Lord Jesus. And how did they treat him? Well, Jesus is talking about this. He knows what's ahead. He, like the son of the vineyard owner would be put to death. I want to think about this portion under a number of headings. The first is to think a little bit about the provision that the Lord makes. And we see it in this vineyard. The vineyard owner doesn't just say to the tenants, there's a plot of ground. Go and build yourselves a vineyard, put up walls and all that you need. No, he does the graft. He has everything in place. The wall is around the vineyard to keep out the predators and for security. There's a wine press built so that 
they, once the, the vines come to fruit, they can gather the grapes and press them in the, vine, in, the, in the wine press and produce their fruit of the vine. The watchtower is built so that the watchman can be there to ward off enemies who might come and destroy or wild animals. It is also in the watchtower sometimes that, that there was housing for some of the workers or storeroom for their equipment. Everything, in other words, is in place for them to easily produce a crop and be able to give something of a reward back to the vineyard owner. And as we have said, the vineyard owner is the Lord God. And it, this vineyard is Israel. And isn't that what God did for Israel? He provided for them all that they needed. He brought them to be a nation. Uh, we, we think of how he took them down into Egypt with the, bro- the sons of Jacob, going down there into Egypt. And there, under those circumstances, they flourished and became a nation. And then under Moses, he brought them out of that bondage that became their bondage in Egypt. But what did he do? He brought them eventually into a land of promise. And God opened up that land. God went before them and destroyed their enemies. They were able to occupy the towns and villages of their enemies, having put them to death. The land was opened before them to occupy. And eventually, under the great kingship of David, their enemies were defeated and they flourished. And as we've been thinking in the morning about Solomon, and we'll return, God willing, next Lord's Day to him and his glory. And wasn't that an amazing time? Everyone at peace. A land of richness and blessing. Such privileges. And God, God their Lord, had provided it all and continued to do so. Everything was there, and they ought to to have responded in worship. They ought to have brought to God every possible uh, good thanks and blessing from their hearts. The provision had been made. All that the Lord had done for his people. But couldn't we say the same thing with regards to our own land, perhaps? We focus on our own nation over the years. We can look back over a tremendous history of spiritual life in our country. We talk still and we refer back to the 59 revival. But if you plot the history of Christ's church, what blessing God has brought into our nation. Britain was, was indeed great, great especially when Christ was on the throne, when he ruled And today, we think about all that God has done. He has provided this nation with so much, and above all, he has given the people the word of God. Today, people in our country don't need to be ignorant of God's truth. At the touch of a button, the internet, it's full of good preaching. Or they can even there open up the Bible in a familiar translation. What blessing God has given. And the Lord has provided. Are they responding with thankfulness? Are they looking to God and saying, Thank you, Lord, and giving themselves to him? Well, we'll see in a moment how they are not doing that. But maybe we need to make this application even more personal to you and to me, to members of the church. How God has blessed us. We have his word. Perhaps from your earliest days you've been taught the word of truth. What a privilege. What a blessing. He has provided for you through your parents and family members and the the church and those who taught you and teach you and are an example to you of the things of God. What blessings he has bestowed upon you. He has provided for you, perhaps, in your daily life. 
guiding you in good business decisions, guiding you in career, guiding you as to the way ahead in whatever stage of life we're at. The Lord has provided. Have you returned to God that worship that he calls for? Have you given yourself wholeheartedly to the living God and know that he is the one deserving of all from you. What a blessing we have that week by week, too, we can come together and fellowship together in his truth and be reminded of the God who is in control, that we are not on our own. He is sovereign. Do we return our worship to him for the glory and honor, the praise of his name? The Lord, the provision of the Lord. But secondly, we just want to note through this parable the, what I'm calling the prompting that the Lord gives. The vineyard owner comes to the time of year when he knows the vines will have produced their crop. And he sends his servants to go and ask for an appropriate amount of the, of the fruit. And it's rightfully his. This is, if you like, the, the, uh, the rent that the, he is properly and appropriately due. And they ought to have readily given it, indeed happily and gladly, because they know that they have been set up uh, and are able to produce far more than they will give a, to, to, as rent. They will be prosperous. And so the servants come to speak to these tenants about what their responsibilities are. And in the same way, the Lord God of Israel sent his servants into Israel to the people of God to remind them of their responsibilities in worship of the living God. Indeed, the prophets often had to bring the people away from their rejection of God, their worship of false gods, their forgetfulness of all the privileges God had bestowed upon them. And the prophets had to declare to them the judgments of God at times for their waywardness to make, to challenge Israel that they should return to the Lord, giving God what was their due, that they might offer to him right sacrifices and offerings. And we know what happened to prophets. They were abused. Jeremiah, think of his life, held in a pit, given, abused in many ways, imprisoned. Others were put to death and killed. The prophets were not received gladly by a rebellious Israel. And yet they came prompting the people, showing them this is what you ought to do. You're God's people. In a sense, they were twice gods. They were gods by creation, but they were gods by cho his choosing and his nation. And they ought to have responded with thanksgiving, giving the fruit of their lives to the living God. And today, isn't it the same truth? We come to a nation today in which we live and we say to people, God made you and you ought to return glory and praise to him. We are to prompt them and to prophesy, preach to them the word of God. Yes, some may listen, but isn't it true that in our nation and in among our people today we find those who are faithful to the things of the living God mocked and dishonored. Indeed, we who hold fast to the eternal truth of God without wavering are often looked and down upon and criticized as narrow-minded bigots, but we are declaring the truth of God. Turn on your television, and when do you ever see someone applauding someone who has stood firm in the faith and stands for all that Jesus Christ stands for. No, they'll be lambasted. There'll be very quickly someone to, to bring them down. It may not be physical death, but we are mocked 
and destroyed. But we are, as God's people, if you like, to be those who are prompting the nation. Perhaps we can also bring it into the context of our church and of the church at large. Today, the word of God has been proclaimed. And week by week, the message of Christ's word goes out to men and women. But are there people, perhaps it could be you, are you listening? And yet you don't hear. You're not giving to God the honor that is his due, even though each Lord's Day we're prompting you, worship the Lord. Remember, he is your creator. There is none other. And you ought to have your life committed, handed over, and given to the living God. Within the context of our own lives, we need the prompting. We need the servants to come and say, give God his due. And graciously, the Lord has given us one day in seven to prompt us, and preachers to prompt us, and his word to remind us we are not our own. We are bought with a price through Jesus Christ. We have been blessed in so many ways. Are you giving to God his due honor and place and delighting to serve him? Or are you still like the unappreciative wicked tenants in this vineyard. I want to go on from there, thirdly, to think about the extraordinary forbearance of the Lord in this parable. As men and women, as if we were in that situation, I would suggest that every one of us would have decided before we sent the last of the prophets, these tenants are no good. We will get rid of them. We would have sent the security forces to go and put them out of the vineyard, and we would have tried to give the vineyard to more profitable, better tenants. We wouldn't have put up with this ongoing antagonism and lack of concern or thankfulness for a good start in life. No, we would have put them out. But the master of this vineyard doesn't act like any other person, because this is a parable, and the master is speaking to us of the living God. And he says, I will send my son. Surely they will respect the son. They will know that I mean business when the son, my closest representative, goes to bring about a change in their hearts. And of course, We have read the parable. They took the son and they put him to death. And Jesus is speaking about himself. For God the Father sent the son. And Jesus knew even as he told this parable and follows it through with his words, they will put me to death. But friends, what extraordinary forbearance of the living God, that he should stoop to give another opportunity by sending his Son into the world, that he might call us to repentance and faith. How absolutely amazing the love of God, that he should send his only begotten Son, that through him we might have life. That through him we would be shown what it is for us to give to God all that is his due. In the parable, the son is taken, abused, and killed. Jesus was taken, abused, and put to death on the cross. But the sovereign God determined that the wickedness of man should be served to honor him. And the resurrected Lord rose to bring glory to the name of God. How today even our Lord forbears our sins. Men come to God as sinners 
and through Jesus Christ they are changed. The wickedness of people is forgiven when they truly seek him. We often wonder why the Lord doesn't strike down people more. They, they see the utter wickedness and all around us. Why does God forbear? Because these are days of grace. Jesus Christ is to be proclaimed. There are yet those who will call upon his name and be brought to know him. Indeed, sometimes we look at the corruption of our society. You know, our wonder ought to be, why is it not worse? Why do we not suffer even greater difficulties and problems? Surely God would hand us over to ourselves and the judgment that that is, and that's what it is. When men do wickedly and God withdraws, that's his judgment. Why? Because the Lord God is a God of love and grace. And it is his that the gospel should be preached. And he stays the way of the wicked in order that we might yet continue to proclaim the way of the Lord and his forbearing and his love. Perhaps you, even as an individual, have to recognize the extraordinary forbearance of the Lord in your life. As a Christian, you've fallen into sin. You have confessed the Lord. You've tried to serve him. But in some matter, you know you have done wrong. You're a sinner. You've sinned, and it grieves you. And yet you feel that you deserve nothing from God's hand. And what does God do for the sinner? He reminds you of the cross. And he brings you to Jesus. And he says to you, look at him. All your sin, all your sin is forgiven in Jesus Christ. Repent and believe. And God in love forbears all our waywardness, our flaws and our faults, and so we ought to be willing to come afresh to him. Have you taken him as your Lord? Are you resting truly on Christ and his great love, walking in his paths? What an extraordinary provision the Lord makes, sending his Son and his Son to die, that you and I might have life. But we move on to recognize that there is a punishment that the rejected Lord will exact. And as Jesus speaks following this parable, we note his words. Jesus asks the question of those who are listening to him, what should be done? What do you think could be done with these wicked tenants? And in verse 41, we read, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent out the vineyard to other tenants, and he will give him a share of the crop. We might say that, in a sense, the rejection of Israel, of the Lord, has meant the gospel coming to us as Gentiles. Paul refers to that. And what a blessing it has been. But it's not that I want to focus on. It is this devastating word of Christ. He says to them, you know, you people, remember the scripture, the stone that was rejected, that piece of rock that was no good in its place. It is taken and becomes the cornerstone. The rejected son will become the cornerstone. The one from whom the whole building gets its place, its shape, its size even, and to whom everyone must be keyed in if they are to be part of the kingdom of God. But note how he goes on in verse 43. I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. God says, I will have my people. 
But then in verse 44, he has this rather devastating word. If this is the rock, he says, and is speaking of himself as this stone, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. But he on whom it falls will be crushed. If Jesus Christ is the one over whom you stumble, you cannot follow him or, or will not follow him, then you will be broken to pieces. And we would pray sometimes that the arrogant, self-centered people that we meet who have no thought of God might come to Jesus and be broken. We long sometimes that they would be broken to realize they have nothing in this world or in the world to come, and they need to come to Jesus Christ broken in their wicked hearts and repent and believe. But if they don't turn to him, they are broken in pieces and there is nothing else that can ever put them together. In fact, Jesus says, they will fall under the punishment. He on whom the stone falls will be crushed. And it's the judgment, the punishment of the Lord. And friends, no matter how awful a thought this is, that punishment of God is a truth in Scripture. This verse, actually, verse 44 in Matthew 21, some of the commentators uh, draw out that it's, it's perhaps suspect if it was in the original, but it does appear in Luke chapter 20 in Luke's account. It is still a truth. The word crushed here is such that it means completely obliterated. Nothing but powder. Yes, it's a horrible thought. It's devastating punishment. But it's the devastation that comes upon those who reject the Son of God and will not walk in his ways and will not return to God the honor and praise and worship that is his due. Many will reject Jesus, and they will say, we will live for ourselves. They will say, like the vineyard uh, tenants, we will put them out and we will do our own thing. No one will stop us. They seem to forget the master of the vineyard still alive. And those who put Jesus to death and those who forget him or reject him forget that God is still on the throne. The creator of all the earth reigns. The world is in his hand. He upholds it. They'll be crushed unless they turn to him. It's a challenge even to those of us who love the Lord. Do we really love him? Are we serving him? And we must not be shy to tell people, you will fall under the punishment of God. We love to tell them of God's love, and that's vital. But they also need to know that without Christ, the crushing blow of the judgment of God, the pains of hell will be upon them. And for us, as a church, we rejoice in his truth because it is in the light of the agonies and the difficulties of the punishment that will come upon our sin that we flee from that and turn to Jesus and his love and delight in him who bore all our sin on the tree, that through him we might have life. What a blessing that we have in Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Lastly, by way just of conclusion, want to note how did the Pharisees, or the Pharisees respond? How did the Israelites hear this message? Well, we note at the end here that the chief priests heard these parables and they knew it was about or intended for them. But did that stop their wickedness? No. 
In the last verse, <coughs> they looked <coughs> for a way to arrest him. They were still intent on destruction. They were still opposed to him. Rather than this bring them to their senses and point them back to the God who was the mighty God. They continued in their destructive course. They would not listen. And they were going to be under the stone rather than tripping over it and coming by repentance and faith to the Lord. What will your reaction be to God's word? If God takes you as a Christian and speaks some word to you, do you ignore it? You say, well, I'm going to, I'm intent on this course of action. I'm going to do it anyway. Friends, that's dishonoring Christ. That's saying of him, you're of no importance. And you will reap, you will reap the wicked rewards or the punishment for such action. Rather, hear the word. Come to the prompting of the word of the living God through Jesus Christ. Get on your knees, repent, and seek to live in you. Give God the glory. He created you, and if he has driven you the word and called you to faith, marvel in him, rejoice in him, praise him, give your life for him, for it is all his. And he desires the fruit of spiritual life in your soul. He desires you to walk for him, serve him, speak of him, delight in him, and honor him. And we need to turn away from being those wicked tenants who will give nothing to the master to being those good tenants who will give him everything he is due, indeed all that we are, for all that we are belongs to him. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we delight in your word. At times we have to hear this word that is bitter, the punishment that is exacted by our God on the sinner. Yet we rejoice as we turn to Jesus. He bore that in his own body on the cross that we wicked sinners might find love and grace and be enabled by the Holy Spirit to return to our God that fruit that is his due a life and a heart given over to Jesus to serve and honor and magnify his name. Father, hear our prayers. Bless your word to us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude as we turn to Psalm 118, and we're singing uh, those stanzas there, 13 to 16 and the tune is Lloyd 109, Psalm 118. This is the Lord's own gate. Uh, <clears throat> by it, the just will enter in. There's only one way through Jesus Christ, the one who was the despised, rejected cornerstone, who has become the capstone. And isn't it absolutely marvelous in our eyes? This is the doing of the Lord. And blessed is the one who comes in the Lord's great name. Psalm uh, 118, 13 to 16, the tune is Lloyd 109. Let us praise God together.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with God's people now and always. Amen.